Hello and welcome to Topic 10, Lecture 2. And in this topic, we're going to take a look at legal rights during a criminal trial. In our lecture on policing, we talked about how it's easy to police in an authoritarian government, but it's much more difficult to police in a democracy. And I want to pick up on that same theme as we're talking about criminal trials in a democracy. Um, in an authoritarian government, it's easy to try, try and convict a person of a crime. Um, that there are uh, basically in an authoritarian regime, the government has no limits and the accused has no trial rights. And so that because the government has no limits during a trial, they could hold a trial without the person being present. Um, they could hold a trial using whatever evidence they wanted to use in order to convict that person. And the accused would have no recourse um, that they would basically be subject to this unlimited power of the government. So when you convict somebody in an authoritarian regime, it, it's hollow, it's meaningless, it's basically a sham. Um, since anybody can be found guilty or anybody can be acquitted of a crime, then when somebody is actually found guilty or acquitted, it, it doesn't, you don't know whether justice has served. Um, and so in an authoritarian regime where the government has no limits on their power and the citizen has no rights, um, criminal convictions and trials have nothing to do with justice. Obviously, it's a lot harder to convict somebody in a, 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 a convict a person of a crime in a democracy. Why? Because in a democracy, the government has clear legal limits um, uh, in terms of what they can do. They have uh, legal limits in terms of the procedures of in, that are in the courtroom. Um, that a person has to be found be guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Only certain kinds of evidence can be submitted. Um, there are, uh, you know, certain rules regarding um, uh, where the trial takes place and whether there's a jury and how the jury is um, uh, selected. Uh, and, and the accused has robust trial rights, which we're going to be learning about in this, um, in this uh, lecture. So conviction in a democracy is, is much less hollow. It's much less of a sham, but let's keep it real. It's far from perfect. Um, that it, 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 as you learn about the rights of the criminally accused and, and, you know, they just sort of touch on it in this chapter, but, um, you know, I teach a class on civil liberties where we go deeply into the rights of the criminally accused. So for the, those of you in this class who are also my civil liberties class, the coming, the chapters that we have coming up about the rights of the criminally accused will really dovetail nicely with what you're learning about in this class. Um, and so yes, conviction in a democracy is much less hollow, but it's far from perfect. Um, the accused really had to fight for these rights. Um, and so early on in our criminal justice system, to take the right of counsel, for example, um, that there was no, even though it's in the Constitution, um, it was that the Sixth Amendment wasn't seen as applying to the states. And so states didn't have to um, give people the right to counsel. Initially, the right to counsel was only defined as the right of counsel in really serious capital offenses. Um, but today, because people fought for the right to those rights that are enumerated in our Constitution, um, the accused have a much um, more robust set of rights, but it, it was through the process of demanding those rights. Um, and, you know, poor, poor and minority folks were the, those who were often the ones who were denied rights. Um, because of racial bias and systemic racism in the United States, um, it's also easier to convict poor and minority or accuse poor and minority people um, uh, for, of, uh, of crimes because they're seen as outgroups, right? And, um, and, and so it's oftentimes uh, poor and minority folks who are fighting for those rights in, uh, in our courts. And uh, it, because of that, we do have a robust set of, of uh, uh, rights during trial. Uh, but keep in mind that we are also far from perfect because as you learn and we'll be learning uh, that you learned in uh, the first lecture about uh, plea bargaining, uh, many, many, many people waive their rights to trial, okay? Waive their Sixth Amendment rights to a trial. We know that 90% um, of people who are charged with the crime uh, plead guilty, only 10% actually go to trial. So even though we have this robust set of, tr of trial rights, oftentimes those rights are waived, which um, maybe calls into question uh, or at least demonstrates how our criminal justice system, even in the democracy, uh, is far from perfect. So where do we find trial rights in the United States Constitution? 
when we were learning about law enforcement, we saw that the rights, uh, the constitutional rights as it um, relates to, to law enforcement are found primarily in the Fourth Amendment and in the Fifth Amendment. Um, so where are trial rights found in the United States Constitution? Well, they're found in, uh, uh, in part in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. And so we will take a look at that in a moment. And they're also found in the Sixth Amendment. So when you think about trial rights, keep in mind the Fifth, the Sixth, and the Fourteenth Amendment. Now let's look at specifically how the Fifth, Fourteenth, and Sixth Amendment relate to uh, rights during trial. Okay, the first thing we're gonna talk about as it relates to the trial rights in the United States Constitution is the concept of due process and how we find the concept of due process or the due process clause in both the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution in the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment of the US Constitution. So what is due process? And due process applies not just to rights in trial, but it applies to all um, uh, aspects of the criminal justice system in the United States. So due process is the assurance that all levels of American government must operate within the law and provide fair procedure, okay? So in other words, that there's an expectation that the United States government is not above the law. They may make the laws, but they also have to abide by the laws, okay? And when we talk about U.S. government or American government, I mean, here we're talking about um, the, in particular, the executive branch and the corrections branch, right? In the criminal justice system, the executive branch are law enforcement because they are taking the laws and putting those into action, prosecutors because they are prosecuting law, um, and then, uh, you know, also uh, corrections because they are, uh, the executive branch, they're implementing law. And so we have to make sure that law, uh, law enforcement, uh, 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 prosecutors, uh, defense attorneys, uh, judges, uh, uh, correctional officers, uh, that they all follow the law and that they also make sure that there's a, an assurance that the government will provide people fair procedures. Um, and so where, where these are actually embedded in the Constitution are in the Fifth Amendment and in the Fourteenth Amendment. And they're embedded in this thing called the Due Process Clause. The Fifth Amendment says many things, but one of the things that the Fifth Amendment says is that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Okay? Um, and that is known as the Due Process Clause it is, as it applies to the federal government. Um, because initially, and I don't want to get into the weeds, but initially the Bill of Rights was not seen as applying to the the um, the states. Okay, and that's where actually the Fourteenth Amendment comes in. And so basically, one of the rights that we have is that if if an, our go our government is trying to take away our life or our liberty or our property, all of which are things that can happen in the course of a, a, a criminal trial or a civil trial, right? Um, that uh, that fair and known legal procedures must be followed, okay? And if they're not followed, then you could say that your due process rights were violated and that you could then ask the courts to, um, you know, uh, settle that dispute about whether or not the procedures that were being used to take away your life, liberty, or property um, uh, were, uh, didn't, were not, uh, did, didn't follow a fair and knowable procedure. Uh, so even though there's not specific things that are written in the Constitution, if you feel like you didn't get a fair procedure in the criminal justice system, you can say that your due process rights were violated. The 14th Amendment is important because the 14th Amendment extends the due process clause to the states. Um, and so the 14th Amendment was added after the Civil War because there was a lot of concern that uh, after the Civil War, that when the Southern states that were slave-owning states, when they rejoined the Union after the abolition of slavery in the United States, um, that the states would um, not treat former slaves fairly and that they would deprive them of their life, liberty, and property without due process of law. And so that what the 14th Amendment says is it's very similar to the Fifth Amendment, but it's set, instead of saying that no person shall be deprived, it says that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And so um, the 14th Amendment is important because it basically says that it doesn't matter whether it's the federal government that's trying to take away your, your uh, violation 
violate your due process, uh, uh, treat you in an unfair and illegal manner, uh, but the states can't do that either, okay? And so a lot of trial rights revolve around this fundamental concept of due process, that fair and noble procedures must be followed if somebody is being tried for a crime. So while the 5th and the 14th Amendment are incredibly important in terms of that they lie the general foundation for the assurance of due process in the, the criminal justice system and actually all aspects of um, government in the United States, it's in the 6th Amendment where we really find um, the specific enumeration of the liberties as it relates to trial rights. To put the uh, Sixth Amendment up here and read it. Don't freak out. There's a lot of liberties in the Sixth Amendment, and we're going to go through these liberties, um, the specific liberties in a moment, but let's take a look at it. So the Sixth Amendment reads, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, so basically a jury of your peers, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel to his defense. So there are a lot of liberties that are enumerated in the Sixth Amendment, and we'll go into those in more detail in a moment. Um, uh, reading through that, I just realized how gender non-neutral the sixth amendment is and i'm going to have to go and look at other amendments because it seems that there is like a gender neutrality to the first amendment but uh there's not there's this assumption i guess that men are the ones who are going to be subject to the criminal trial um but i'll set that to aside for a second and um let's take a look at these enumerated rights now, before we look at the enumerated rights in the Sixth Amendment, I did want to return to the Fifth Amendment for a second because there's another aspect in the Fifth Amendment that applies to trial rights. And that um, that right is the right to um, that you have the right to refuse to testify at your trial, um, that the Fifth Amendment says that no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. Um, and so that you basically have the right to remain silent. And so that you have the right to remain silent um, as you're being interrogated by the police. We know that. But in any criminal case, and that has to do with the trial as well. And so you have the right to refuse um, to testify. You, you can't be forced to testify. And also you can't tell the jury that, well, this person didn't testify at their trial. Take that into consideration as you are deliberating. You cannot do that because of your Fifth Amendment rights. Uh, you noted that Derek Chauvin did not, he exercised his Fifth Amendment rights um, and did not, sir, he did not take the stand to testify on his behalf. Be interesting the way that that plays out in the Chauvin trial um, as we come closer to, um, as the jury is deliberating. Um, that when you look at, and I'm not taking a, st I mean, I'm not drawing any conclusions of how I think the jury will rule, um, but you know, when all you, when much of what you have is that tape of Derek Chauvin um, with his knee on the neck of George Floyd, sort of easy to see Derek Chauvin as this, like, this, this, like, person of pure evil, right? Um, and I was wondering if he took the stand, whether he not, might have humanized himself a little bit, um, but their defense um, must have just really felt that that was not going to be prudent in the long run. Um, so I guess we'll never know, but it's a good example of exercising your Fifth Amendment rights to not testify at your trial. Now, as you're le learning about the legal rights during trial, I really want you to keep due process in mind. So when you're learning about trial rights, I want you to ask yourself for each of these enumerated rights, how do these rights satisfy the promise of due process? In other words, how do these rights provide assurance that the trial procedure is fair? Again, it's easy to convict in an authoritarian regime, but in a, in a, in a democratic government, in a democracy, um, that we have these liberties that give us an assurance that the procedure is fair. So keep that in mind. How are all these enumerated rights um, kind of bringing us closer to due process, bringing us closer to feeling that this is in fact a fair trial? So let's look at the rights. Okay, so the Sixth Amendment tells us that the defendant has the right to a speedy and public trial, an impartial judge, and if it's a jury trial, a right to an impartial jury. There's a couple things I want to say about this. Um, for one, the Sixth Amendment actually doesn't tell us that you that the 
defendant has a right to an impartial judge. Um, but the defendant does have that right to an impartial judge. And really that stems forth more from the 14th and 5th Amendment due process clause than it has to do specifically with the enumerated rights in the 6th Amendment. Um, and so, you know, as your textbook points out that there have been cases that have come to the Supreme Court where an individual felt that the judge was basically had like a personal um, a direct interest in the conviction of the individual, right? That the, the judge was not impartial in listening to what was going on, but actually felt that this person should be convicted, that they were guilty as charged. And then that, you know, that, that concern was brought up in appeal to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said that, um, that even though it's not enumerated in the Sixth Amendment, because of the due process clause, that uh, a, the defendant has a right to an impartial judge. So if one does not exist, then um, then there could be grounds for a mistrial or a, an, an appeal, a successful appeal. Um, and so think to yourself, why is an impartial judge important to due process? Well, it's important because you want to feel like the, 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 the trial isn't rigged, right? You really want somebody who's listening to the evidence, both the jury and the judge, who is, um, you know, looking at the evidence with an open mind without any preconceived notions. Uh, you know, and that, you know, that, that uh, you have a right to a trial um, and, and it can be a trial with the jury. Um, and if it is a jury trial, that you have a right to an impartial jury. So not all offenses have a right to trial. This, and the Supreme Court has, you know, these questions about how do we define a right to a jury trial? How expansive is that right? Those questions have come to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court has, has answered the question. Uh, they basically said the Sixth Amendment right to trial, jury trial, not right to trial, but a right to a jury trial. Um, extends to uh, uh, only to those cases where there uh, where a serious offense is being considered. And so uh, the way the Supreme Court has defined the right to a jury trial is if that the, the possible sentence could be six months or more. So most misdemeanors, okay? So you don't have a right to a jury trial when a traffic, you know, offense, but you would for a misdemeanor that has a penalty of six months or more. Um, and so if, uh, if you, uh, if you have a jury trial, you have to make sure that the, the jury is impartial. And so how do you go about that? You can also ask the question about not allowing a jury trial, but for the most more serious offenses, those that have a jail sentence of six um, months or more, you can think about that according to due process. Um, do you feel like that it's fair to deny people a jury trial for more minor offenses? I think you could probably say yes, it, it, you know, that you don't, since it is a more minor offense that a judge could probably determine the, the guilt or not guilt, uh, you know, and the consequence of an error would not be as great as the consequence of an error of um, six months. And everybody always has a right to an appeal, whether there's a jury or a judge. Um, when it comes to selecting an impartial jury, uh, that your textbook talks a lot about that as steps of the jury trial. So I'll leave it to you to read it. But I'll just point out that when we are selecting a jury, and if you followed the Derek Chauvin trial at all, um, there was an extensive, um, you know, jury selection process because who sits on the jury, as we see, um, you know, makes a big difference in terms of the fairness of the trial uh, and also the confidence that we have in the decision being fair. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the due process, the fair process that's used for jury selection uh, relates to veneer, void deer, and challenges. So um, veneer is basically that when you're, when you're, when you're, uh, seating a jury, you have to seat that jury from a pool that's representative of the people that live in your community. And so like, let's use Milwaukee County or Hennepin County, right? Where Derek Chauvin's trial is taking place. If you just pulled the jury from, um, you know, an unrepresentative sample of the people who live in Milwaukee County, that wouldn't be fair, right? Everybody should have an equal chance to serve on the jury. And so that, um, that veneer is in, in, in Wisconsin, it is uh, derived from driver's license. And so 18 years old and older, uh, it's a big pool of people that with state IDs or driver license that, you know, basically say, this is the pool. It's sort of representative because most everybody has a state ID and a driver's license. 
Um, it's not that you own a home or that you own a car or that you vote, right? If you use that as the pull for the jury, it wouldn't be a representative, but this comes closer to being representative. And so you select people from the veneer, the pool of potential jurors, and void dear is when you question the jurors, right? They're under oath, they're questioned, and um, you know, you get a sense of whether or not they're appropriate to sit on the jury. Uh, your textbook talks about different kinds of challenges uh, as well. Um, they in the textbook you talk about that there's challenges for cause. Uh, for jurors, and then there are these things called peremptory challenges. And so, you uh, you know, a defense attorney or a prosecuting attorney can say, we don't want that juror because they know the person or because they have a connection to the case or that there's, um, you know, that, that their spouse has been a victim of homicide. So, you know, that, that it, it, you know, that they, they might be biased in terms of this. And so you can get rid of as many jurors. There's no limit on challenges for cause. Um, but we also just let prosecutors and defense attorneys basically challenge for no reason, right? Um, and, in, you know, that's what a peremptory challenge is. So you can just say, we don't want that person, we don't want that person, but you don't have to provide a reason for that. Now you can't, if there seems to be a, a trend or, or uh, 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 in terms of like you're getting rid of all the women or you're getting all, rid of all the black folks or whatever, or all the white folks for the jury, I mean, that's unconstitutional, right? But peremptory challenges, you know, that you can give opportunity to um, select a jury that seems to be best fit for both the defense and the prosecution because both of those get those challenges, those peremptory challenges. So, you know, uh, again, it comes a little bit closer to due process, but there's always going to be errors in that. Uh, and then, you know, when it comes to due process in a speedy and public trial, you want the trial to be public because if it's behind door, closed doors, we can't really, the public can't really evaluate the fairness of the trial. Um, and it needs to be speedy because if you, tr if you uh, charge somebody with a crime and they either can't make bail or they're in denied bail and they're just languishing in jail for years after years after years uh, and they never get their trial, then they're just going to plead guilty or it's just uh, the evidence won't be relevant anymore because so much time has passed. So these features are very important towards the assurance of due process and most of them are enumerated in the Sixth Amendment. Okay, so when it comes to the rights of the defendant um, from both the Sixth Amendment and then also from the due processes clause in the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendment, um, the defendant has a right to be competent at their trial and the defendant has a right to be present at their trial. And so think about why that's important to ensure that there's a fair procedure that's going on. Well, when it comes to being competent at, at trial, if you are trying somebody who has a mental illness that is so severe that they cannot understand, they can't, en they can't enter a plea of guilty or not guilty, um, they don't understand the charges against them, um, and most importantly, if you are, you know, either have mental illness or suffer from some really um, grave uh, kind of, uh, you know, a, a substance addiction, um, or if you are have dementia or a really low IQ, right, um, that you really can't participate in your own defense. You can't help your defense attorneys mount a good defense. Um, and so it's really easy to convict somebody who is incompetent um, because they aren't able to exercise their rights. But that would make a mockery, obviously, of fair process. Um, also, you have a right to be present at your trial. Um, and so, uh, like, uh, for a variety of reasons that we're going to look at in a moment, but you have to be there to be able to participate in your trial itself, participate in your defense. Um, and usually you, your defense attorney does that on your behalf, but if you're not even there, then you can't even assess you know, the, the quality and the value that the states are, is making, the, you know, in their, in their, in their prosecution of you, and you can't determine the quality of the defense that you are receiving. Now, um, you, you, uh, before we talk about the right to confront witnesses, while you do have a right to be present in a trial, you can waive your right. Um, and so if you don't want to be there and you say, I don't, I'm going to waive my right to be present, you can do that. And also, as your textbook points out, if you're acting out, if you come to trial and you're screaming and, you know, calling, you know, people names and stuff and like not behaving, then you can be removed from the courtroom, right? And so you basically uh, like, um, you know, that right is not going to be afforded to you because you're not following the rules of the process, okay? 
Um, the criminal defendant has the right to confront their witnesses. Let's just go ahead and put these up here, and then we'll talk about these um, uh, separately, okay? So you have the right to, the defendant has the right to confront witnesses, and they also have a right to what's known as the compulsory process. Um, the right to confront witnesses is incredibly important, and it's known as the confrontation clause in the Sixth Amendment. And what the right to confront witnesses is, is that the defendant has to have an opportunity to cross-examine witnesses that are testifying against the defendant, right? So, so they have to have an opportunity to cross-examine the prosecution witnesses. And that's really important because, um, one, uh, that uh, if you don't, if, there, if you didn't have an opportunity to confront the witness, the witness wouldn't have to come to the courtroom, right? They could write a deposition and the deposition could be um, presented. That would make it easier for them to lie because they'd have, not have to actually confront you in the in the courtroom and, and tell those lies to basically your face. Also, you have the right to confront the, the witness against you because then you can ask them questions. You can, your defense attorney can, you know, uh, sort of dig to show sort of the the falsities of what they're saying or the insincerity of what they're saying um and and, and that's an important an, an important part of that process um as your textbook points out that um the supreme court has not allowed video testimony for that reason because if you present a video of somebody testifying you don't have the opportunity to exercise the confrontation clause it also prevents hearsay testimony right so if somebody comes to a, a court and they're testifying and what they say is is that oh i saw the defendant stab his wife to death right well that is a direct testimony and they can be confronted on that direct testimony but if that witness is saying my cousin told me that the defendant stabbed their wife to death right well they didn't hear it firsthand right they heard it and then they're saying it hearsay that's why it's called that right um and so there's no uh, it's secondhand uh testimony and you're not able to actually confront the witness that saw the event so that's why hearsay testimony is secondhand um uh, evidence is not uh testimonial evidence is not allowed in a court okay you also have the opportunity to help yourself and that's what's the right to a compulsory process in the sixth amendment in other words that you have the right uh, to um uh, secure witnesses in your favor and that um that right is backed up by subpoena power so a subpoena is a, a court order that forces somebody to testify in court and if they don't follow that court order, they can get in trouble for it, right? That's a violation of, of the law, of the court order. And there's a penalty for that. And so the witness, uh, the defendant has the right to call witnesses and that's backed up with the power of the court. Again, keep in mind, why is this all related to due process, right? Well, if you convict somebody, but they're not able to present their own witnesses, if you can convict somebody, but the defendant can't question the witnesses that the prosecution brings, it makes a mockery, right? It makes the system um, uh, 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 more hollow and getting further and further away from justice. We have two more rights to talk about and perhaps one of the most important rights, not the most important, but one of the most important trial rights. And also it's interesting to see how this trial right has changed over time is the right to counsel, right? That you have the right for a, uh, a lawyer to come and provide you the assistance of counsel in your defense against these charges that are leveled against you. Um, that's established in the Sixth Amendment, but the Sixth Amendment was subject to interpretation by the Supreme Court. It says that you, um, that the criminally accused are afforded um, uh, the right to counsel, but what does that actually mean? And the Supreme Court had a very, fair, fairly narrow reading of the Sixth Amendment initially. Uh, initially, the Sixth Amendment was um, it, seen as only applying to the most serious offenses. Um, that is the offenses. So the right to counsel, uh, you know, if you could afford an attorney, then, you know, you can bring that attorney. Like right? that, There's nothing that the state has to do. The right to counsel usually has to do with people who don't, can't afford an attorney, because if you could afford it, you would exercise it. But if you can't afford it, you know, the question is, is do you have this fundamental constitutional right for the state to provide you with that counsel? And so in Powell v. Alabama, this is a really interesting case um, uh, that, again, my civil liberty students will be reading in a couple of weeks, one week or two. Um, the, this case is basically about uh, a, a group of, uh, of young men who were accused of um, rape, and it was a capital offense, and they were African-American. 
and they were tried without the right to counsel or without uh, so that they were denied their sixth amendment rights to counsel in coming out of Powell v. Alabama, the decision in that case was overturned and they were retried because that they were they they did not have that right. And the court said that the poor have a right to counsel in capital offenses. So in the most serious cases, it was later extended to that the poor have a right to counsel in federal cases, not just serious capital offenses where the punishment is the death penalty. Um, but the poor have a right to counsel when the federal government is trying you. And that was 1938. But it wasn't until 1963. And again, the extra credit um, project that the movie that you can write, watch Gideon's Army about public defenders wasn't until 1963 that the Sixth Amendment right to counsel was extended to the states. And so in Gideon v. Wearing White, the poor have a right to counsel in, um, in, in state offenses as well. And so today, defend including juveniles receive robust rights to counsel um, that if your freedom can be taken away as a product of your trial even if it can just be taken away for an hour a potential sentence is one day in jail or one hour in jail or whatever then you have the right to counsel at your trial okay um and so uh, uh you can waive that right and uh, people do waive the right to counsel it's really not advised because unless you have a d law degree you're probably not going to do well um but pro se is where you're basically saying that you're providing your own defense but like i said it's not advised and while the right to be con so the final right we're going to talk about is that you have a right to be convicted only if the state proves guilt uh, for each of the elements of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt, okay? You can't be convicted if the state can't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you are, in fact, guilty. While that is not in the Sixth Amendment, again, it's related to the fair process, about due process. Um, there's lower burdens of proof for civil trials, as we know. Um, but when it comes to criminal trial trials, since the consequence of being found guilty in a criminal trial is much greater than in a civil trial, uh, usually um, that we want to have the highest burden of proof which is beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not with absolute certainty keep in mind, but it's that without doubt you feel that this person has is guilty of what they're being charged with. Okay, so I'm just ending with the, the slide we had at the beginning. Now that you've learned about the rights to tr in trial, the constitutional rights in trial, um, just keep in mind, um, how do these rights satisfy the promise of due process? In other words, how do these rights provide assurance that the procedure is fair? And as you're, you know, obviously you're right, you just wrote your paper on locked in and they talk a lot about due process and the rights of uh, the criminally accused. And so you can think about that along these lines as well. Okay, thanks for your attention.